Good day, I'm Tom Costello, in for Hallie, and tonight, former President Trump is at his golf club in New Jersey, set to dine with Republicans. That's about 1,200 miles from his home in Florida, where the FBI carried out an unprecedented search warrant at his home, a visit that could have massive political implications for the 2024 presidential race and legal implications for the former president. Here's what we know about the, what the FBI is looking for. A source familiar with the matter tells NBC News it's connected to classified information the former president allegedly took to Palm Beach after he left office. One senior official says the search took a majority of the day. NBC News has also learned the Secret Service did know about his visit shortly before the FBI arrived, and those FBI agents presented Secret Service agents with a signed warrant. That's not how the former president sees it. He's calling this an unannounced raid that is, quote, not necessary or appropriate. He's also claiming, without evidence, there were political motivations behind the search. Mr. Trump is not in Florida. Here he is last night leaving Trump Tower in Manhattan ahead of a deposition with New York's attorney general. The Biden White House tells NBC News it did not know about this search ahead of time and it isn't commenting any further. The Justice Department also not talking. We're going to talk, though, to NBC's Ken Delanian and Ben Collins in just a moment. But we are starting with Vaughn Hilliard, who's at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. So, Vaughn, we're hearing the search is related to a referral from the National Archives. What do we know about these documents and why do they matter? And we know that it is the Trump team's understanding, at least from what we are aware of, that the focus here is over materials that were taken from the White House, brought here to Mar-a-Lago at the end of the Donald Trump presidency here. Now, we have known that these documents existed here at Mar-a-Lago for several months now, but it became under the inquiry of the Department of Justice uh, at some point here over the course of the summer. Uh, we also know that the Department of Justice had its previously established contact with, uh, with the, uh, Trump's lawyers here and had conversations about these documents. But what we do not know is exactly uh, which of uh, these materials that were seized in what we are told are several boxes of documents. We do not know exactly what the intent of this investigation is, exactly what they are investigating. If it is truly uh, just the extent to which there may be classified materials that uh, were not documented by the archives that were existing here uh, on the, uh, the residency of Donald Trump, or whether the investigation uh, uh, extends elsewhere. Of course, Donald Trump is uh, presently the focus of several uh, investigations, uh, uh, personal, but then also those that are related to his time in the White House, Tom. All right. And also Republicans are furious. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is warning the attorney general to clear his calendar, suggesting future congressional investigations if Republicans regain control of Congress. Right. So what else are you hearing? Right. And, and there's other members of Congress that have called for the defunding of the Department of Justice, the defunding of the FBI. Uh, they have squared up the justice system of the executive branch and called into question whether this is uh, intended as a political opposition campaign to undermine Donald Trump, who has suggested himself that he may run for president, announcing as soon as within the next three months. Take a listen to Senator Lindsey Graham, an ally of Donald Trump, characterizing a conversation he had just this afternoon with the former president. The one thing I can tell you is that I believe he was going to run before. I'm as stronger in my belief now. Several Republicans, including the likes of Ted Cruz and Mike Pence, have called on the Department of Justice, however, Merrick Garland, to step forward and document what the probable cause was that led to this search warrant, saying that it is important for the American public to understand what was behind the intent of this search warrant here at the former president's residence. Tom? All right, Vaughn, thank you. Vaughn Hilliard, who's uh, right outside Mar-a-Lago. Let's go to NBC Justice correspondent Ken Delanian. Ken, we still don't know much about the probable cause behind this warrant, but how high would the bar have to be to get approval to search the house of a former president? Well, Tom, in theory, it should be the same for everybody, right? But the practical reality of this situation is it was probably twice as hard or more for the FBI to justify this dramatic an escalatory step, and it's very likely that it went to the highest levels of the Justice Department, that Attorney General Merrick Garland made the decision to do this in consultation, perhaps, with FBI Director 
Christopher Ray because before they even considered taking this to the judge, they had to decide on their own that this was the best way to get the information that they were seeking, that just simply asking for the documents wasn't going to work, that a subpoena demanding legally the documents wasn't going to be effective, and they must have had reason to believe that. And often in these cases, it's because they've uh, uncovered some kind of deception or some kind of plan to hide evidence. We don't know what the situation was here, but we do know that they were able to go to a judge and demonstrate probable cause that a crime uh, was committed and that evidence for that crime was inside Mar-a-Lago, uh, and they decided to go and get it. And it, it wasn't a raid because they knocked on the door and they were granted entry by the Secret Service, but they had the authority from that judge to break down the door if they needed to do that. This was a compelled search. Donald Trump says that they uh, they broke open his safe. The government hasn't confirmed that, but it would be would have been within their rights, Tom, to do that. A really, really dramatic, uh, provocative step uh, by the government in an investigation that we don't really fully understand at this moment. Yeah, and the raid is in the eye of the beholder, of course. Uh, the former president calling this political persecution. Any evidence at all to support that? You know, there really isn't, and, and the irony of this is the context here is that this, mo this moment in time comes after the FBI and the Justice Department really were lambasted in an in a inspector general report about how some aspects of the Trump-Russia investigation were handled, particularly the pursuit of warrants, FISA warrants, and in one case, an FBI lawyer was uh, convicted of a felony and lost his career, and there was a lot of criticism about that. And, and that's why Republicans are saying this is the fix is in here. But uh, to my mind, as somebody who covers the Justice Department, that's exactly why uh, I know that these people are being doubly careful, because they know that everything they're doing here is going to come under scrutiny. And unlike the FISA process, which is very secret, eventually we will all see this affidavit justifying this warrant, and we'll be able to evaluate for ourselves whether they had a good reason to do this and whether the federal judge who granted this was right, Tom. That's a very good point. Ken, thank you. Ken Delanian. Uh, supporters for the former president have lined the streets outside of Mar-a-Lago. You see a woman right here letting a Make America Great flag blow in the wind today. And last night, an even bigger gathering outside. Dozens were on hand to support Mr. Trump. But what we're seeing online is a lot darker. The top comment on the pro-Trump forum, the Donald, is, quote, lock and load with references to a civil war. NBC's Ben Collins spends his time in the dark web. Nice place to be, Ben, but uh, you're learning exclusively now about the person who wrote about the Civil War, and he's someone who stormed the Capitol back on January 6th. Yeah, underneath that comment, which said lock and load, there was a comment about a Civil War, about how we're in a cold Civil War right now. That guy uh, actually stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, he uh, uh, made his way in. He was, has effectively a trespassing charge. It's a 40-year-old man from Washington who we identified based on a selfie that he took both at the Capitol and a couple of days beforehand, and posted it to the Donald, which is that extremist site where they planned a lot of January 6th. So the idea that this, these are just some random people online just saying uh, stuff that they won't do in public or in person, that is not true. In fact, that rally that you just talked about last night, uh, that was an impromptu rally pushed on the Donald and pushed on Telegram, pushed on these extremist forums. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are some people who showed up who had no idea about those extremist forums, but I'm also sure that the opposite is true as well. Well, I think January 6th taught us all that you believe what they say when they say it. At least you take it seriously. And we're also seeing similar threats on mainstream platforms, right, like Twitter and YouTube. Yeah, I mean, there are people with five, six million followers on YouTube uh, talking about how uh, today is the start of the war, so sleep well. Uh, there's a guy named Steven Crowder who has six million view, uh, subscribers on YouTube and two million followers on Twitter. Uh, there are people talking about crossing the Rubicon who, has, who have millions of followers on Twitter and YouTube. These are regular uh, mainstream Trump uh, Republicans who are uh, part of their Stephen Crowder there, as you can see. He um, says tomorrow is war. These are people who have massive podcasts who have been previously subsidized by places like Facebook or YouTube. And they are not talking about, you know, settling our differences or anything like that. They are talking about violence. They are talking about the war. Um, and that's what they think is next, is a civil war. So can you explain then, wh why is war such a dominant theme among Trump supporters, or at least this particular slice of Trump supporters? Why, why is there such a preoccupation with war? You know, they've been prepped with this sort of talk for years. Um, 
by people like Alex Jones, for example, in the, in the extreme set, who have said that the apocalypse is coming, or at least the civil war is coming. So you have to prep for it, to get a bunch of guns. You have to get your prepper kits ready and things like that. And they, they said they always warned you for this day where they would come and get your guns or they would come and take away your, you know, your favorite politician, that you're next if they start with Donald Trump. That's the big talking point right now as well. Um, these are people who are very focused on, you know, their version of the end of this country. Uh, they think it is upon us as we speak. They think this is a direct attack on them. Um, so that's why they, they are at their last straw. That's what they keep saying about this. Um, they take this as a personal affront because of the cult, cult of personality uh, that has surrounded Donald Trump for all these years. NBC's Ben Collins, who spends a lot of time following this stuff. Ben, thank you very much. Tonight, the White House monkeypox response team is announcing what it calls game-changing new plans to stretch out the country's monkeypox vaccine supply with guidance from the FDA. The agency plans to use a new method of injecting people using just one-fifth of the current dosage, a plan that would transform 400,000 existing vials into 2 million doses for Americans. This is a, a big move that could help alleviate the nationwide shortage of the shot. We've seen the long lines for vaccines in cities like New York and San Francisco, there's simply not enough vaccine for even the most vulnerable communities. And the Biden administration has really gotten into a lot of criticism and heat over this. As of yesterday, there are almost 9,000 confirmed monkeypox cases across the USA. Monica Alba is at the White House. Monica, talk, walk us through right now what we learned today about the plan and is it a long-term solution? The Biden administration is under a lot of pressure here, Tom, to help with this public health emergency. That had been something that many advocates and critics had called for. The White House finally decided to do that last week. They've appointed several coordinators to try to lead the effort. And then today in a briefing, they did unveil this new strategy, which essentially changes the way that the shot is administered. So now it's going to be going in subdermally. Essentially what that means is going into the top layers of your skin instead of subcutaneously, which was to go into the fat. Essentially what this means and boils down to is that that little dot vial of vaccine can now be five doses instead of just the one. So it absolutely does help in terms of getting more availability. And that's something that these health experts say is the most important thing to do. Those eight thousand nearly nine thousand cases you just talked about according to experts that's an undercount and they expect that number to go up dramatically and that's why they're trying to use this emergency use authorization it's things we've seen a lot and talked about in the last couple of years as it relates to the covid pandemic but this is for monkeypox and they say this is the first step of several in which they're going to try to act get people to have more access to these critical vaccines tom all right, so how soon does the new game plan go into effect and how quickly will shots be going into arms, especially in those areas with most cases, like California, like New York? The White House today, according to these coordinators, said, please start this immediately, essentially urging providers who are giving out the shots to do it and go into effect as early as today if they can. But the real interesting numbers here is that the vulnerable population is estimated to be around 1.6 or 1.7 million, and right now, even with this change, this only accounts for maybe a population of about 1.1 million. So they're gonna continue to have to produce more, purchase more of the vaccine. And then what's also important is that people need to realize there still are multiple doses you have to get. You have to get two of these shots four weeks apart. So then that also divides the number in half. So availability just still continues to be a huge problem. And this is something where people have been raising for weeks. They've seen the log jam. You saw those long lines. Mm -hmm. Those are expected only to grow, but now at least they have a bit of a creative solution. But it is a short-term one, and they expect to have to do more and purchase and get more access to these vaccines in the long term, Tom. Monica Alba on duty at the White House. Thank you very much. Uh, let's now get to the weather where you are certainly feeling it. Uh, today, more than 40 million people are under heat alerts across the Northeast and New England. Depending on where you are, there is a good chance that you are literally feeling the burn, especially bad in places like the tri-state area where they're dealing with this double hit of heat and humidity. New York's maximum heat index, how hot it actually feels, 96 degrees today. So cooling centers are open throughout that city. Boston and Connecticut health officials also extending their severe hate guidelines. 
But there is some good news. There is, one, there is some relief on the way. Temperatures expected to start dropping as soon as tomorrow. Uh, we have Lindsay Reiser joining us now from Coney Island, not on the rides, suffering through the heat. All right, Lindsay, how hot is it there and what are you expecting tomorrow? I got to tell you, that heat index, Tom, you just mentioned in the city, 95 degrees, that's nothing. I have seen on my phone, it has gone up to 106. Again, what it feels like out here, and boy, it has felt that hot. Dare I say right now, though, it's actually kind of nice. There's a breeze. This is also the busiest that we've seen it on the boardwalk and the beach. Uh, but a lot of people out here today trying to beat that heat, staying in the water all day. I talked to a lot of people, both tourists and locals alike. This is what some of them told me. Drink a lot of water and, um, yeah. Did you think it was going to be this hot when you came to visit? No, we thought it was going to be a lot cooler. We even packed some jackets. Yeah, we try to stay outside or we try to be outside or a movie theater, you know? <laughs> so this is one of the choice. Pool, beach, movie theater. So that heat advisory, Tom, is in effect until 8 o'clock tonight. But you did mention that relief that's on the way. It's going to feel at least 10 degrees cooler by tomorrow in this area, and it's just going to keep cooling off through the week, Tom. I just checked my phone. 106 is the heat index here in Washington, D.C., but I think that means about 322 degrees, even hotter than yesterday when it was 320. All right, Boston is in the midst of the hottest month long stretch on record, right? And that puts enormous strain on everybody from City Hall to ambulance teams to hospitals. That's right. I mean, we saw Providence, Rhode Island, they tied the record at 95. Boston, they set a record at 98 degrees. And so this puts a lot of strain on cities, a lot of people who maybe don't have the best working AC or AC at all. So cities like New York City, they set up cooling centers anytime we get these heat advisories, anytime that heat index is uh, 100 or more for any number of days or 95 or more for two consecutive days in a row. So people can go to some of these centers, they can cool off. We also just saw a bunch of kids uh, jumping around in some splash pads. That's incredibly popular. And something that we have unique uh, here in New York City, Tom, you can actually ask the FDNY for one of those hydrant caps so you can kind of create your own splash pad in some of these neighborhoods, Tom. Oh, viewers of this program know how popular those uh, splash pads are with kids. Absolutely. Hey, Lindsay, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Stay cool. All right, back here in D.C., the January 6th committee is sitting down today for a virtual deposition with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The committee has said publicly that they anticipate talking to more members of former President Trump's cabinet. It comes after an unsuccessful virtual meeting with Doug Mastriano today, the GOP nominee for governor in Pennsylvania. Now, Mastriano's attorney says his deposition lasted less than 15 minutes due to disagreements about the deposition's procedure, his attorney adding he did not answer any questions and that they would be filing a legal complaint. Coming up right here, Speaker Pelosi is defending her controversial trip to Taiwan, what she's saying about China's leader in our five things. Plus, I'm back with an exclusive look inside Space Command. We'll have a preview of how the U.S. tracks every rocket and missile launch anywhere in the world in space. That's coming up. We're back on News Now, and we, we want to get you over to the five things that our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, this morning on the Today Show, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi defended her recent trip to Taiwan. She says the controversial visit was worth it, despite China's aggressive response, which included a live fire military exercises. In a different interview on MSNBC's Morning Joe, Pelosi said that China's president was, quote, acting like a scared bully, her words. Number two, police in Northern California say they are still searching for a 16-year-old girl who vanished from a big party near a campground of, uh, north of Lake Tahoe on Saturday. Investigators are treating this case as an abduction. They are conducting aerial searches for her and for her car. Number three, more legal trouble for actor Ezra Miller. Vermont State Police say Miller has been charged with felony burglary. The actor is accused of stealing several bottles of alcohol from a home back in May. Police say no one was home at the time and that there is surveillance video that allegedly links Miller to the crime. A spokesperson for Miller declined to comment. 
Number four, Domino's is reportedly closing the last of its 29 branches in Italy. Bloomberg reports it's been in the country for about seven years, but hasn't been able to win over local customers. Really? Italians don't like Domino's? <laughs> the company is not commenting. Number five, French environmentalists are trying to do everything they can to save a beluga whale that strayed into the Seine River last week. They hope to move it to a saltwater tank and then by van to guide it back to sea. Now, belugas typically live in the Arctic, so it's not clear why this one swam so far from home. Looking for love, I think. Tonight, we have an exclusive look at the U.S. efforts to keep tabs on the world's hot zones, from Ukraine to Taiwan to North Korea. It's up to the U.S. Space Command to track every rocket, every missile launch, and then determine whether it poses a threat to the U.S. And for the first time ever, NBC News got a look inside this highly classified ops center. This is U.S. Spacecom Jock with an Operation Olympic Defender Conference. I'll come for you to respond when pull. Last week, our cameras were the first ever allowed inside the Space Command Joint Operations Center in Colorado Springs. The zenith, the very top of our space operations centers within the Department of Defense. Where the U.S. watches and tracks every missile and rocket launch anywhere in the world. From the war in Ukraine to Chinese military exercises off Taiwan to that Russian satellite launch. How quickly do they learn that something has launched somewhere in the world? We have some really good space capabilities today that will tell us almost immediately if there's been a launch. Longitude 80 degrees, 36 minutes west. In a show of force last November, Russia blew up one of its own orbiting satellites. And we continue today to track almost 1,500 pieces of debris from that uh, incident and that test event that they did. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, we're going to take you inside Space Command's Joint Operations Center in Colorado. It's manned 24-7. They watch the skies and outer space for any signs of a threat. And we'll hear from the commanding four-star general, who says Russia is demonstrating unsafe, potentially threatening behavior in space. That story tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Still to come, the first big GOP primary since the FBI's raid on Mar-a-Lago. What voters in Wisconsin are saying right now. And in New Mexico, Albuquerque, police say a suspect in the murders of Muslim men there has now been detained. We're going to have an update on that later in the hour. We're back, and the primary polls in the battleground state of Wisconsin are set to close in just a couple of hours from now. Voters there are the first in the country to test the Trump endorsement less than 24 hours after the FBI searched his Mar-a-Lago home. The big contest, the GOP race for governor, and whether the endorsements of top leaders and the party are influencing voter decisions. Former President Trump endorsed Michael, businessman, Michael Michael, <laughs> make that Tim Michaels, campaigning for him in the state just last Friday. While former Vice President Mike Pence and former Governor Scott Walker ha have both supported former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish. And a key Senate race will be set tonight as well. And that could help determine the balance of power in the Senate come November. Joining me now is Shaq Brewster. All right, Shaq, let's start out with the governor's race. Big endorsements, splitting the candidates and the party. So what have you been hearing from voters and how are they reacting to the FBI search at Mar-a-Lago? Does that influence the way they vote? Well, Tom, I'll tell you, a lot of voters have told me that they are stressed, and some of them said they weren't going to make a decision until they were actually casting their ballot. And that's because of those names that you mentioned there, both President Trump, Vice President Pence, and also former Governor Scott Walker. They all endorsed in this race, choosing different sides here and setting the different paths of the Republican Party uh, for this race here. And, you know, one thing that I've been hearing from voters when you ask that question of whether or not that FBI search that we saw in Florida had an impact on their vote. No one has told me it's impacted their vote, but they have had opinions on what they saw there. I want you to listen to some of those conversations. It doesn't surprise me. It'll be interesting to see what happens uh, from that. When they do that, nobody's above the law, so they're just doing their job. Does it make you feel any better to know that a judge signed off on it before it happened? No, I'm tired of it. 
I feel like there's a lot of things to be investigated besides Trump in our government. And it just doesn't seem to happen that way. Now, while you had voters not really thinking about the uh, breaking news as they were going into the polls, or at least telling me that, you did have both of the candidates this morning uh, being asked about it, and both of them had similar tones, saying that they were shocked or outraged by it. Uh, Tim Michaels uh, repeating a lot of the language that you're hearing from other Republicans across the country, saying that if it could happen to a former president, then it can happen to you, and saying if you're upset by that, then he was driving people to go out to the polls in this primary election. So everyone's expecting this to be close, and it doesn't appear as if, based on my conversations, as if that news is having an impact on folks coming out to the polls today. You know, but isn't that the point? I mean, it can happen to a former president. It can happen to you because nobody is above the law. At least that's the, the prevailing theory. But right. Republican Ron Johnson, a big Trump supporter, on the January 6th rally as well, is up for re-election. So what are voters there telling you about their opinions of Ron Johnson and his likely challenger, the Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes? Well, right now, it's Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, who is the one who uh, is seeking to take on Ron Johnson in what is expected to be a blockbuster Senate race once we hit November. Uh, it was a really competitive primary. I mean, how we've been talking about the Republican primary for governor, that was how we were talking about the Senate primary for, uh, the, or the Democratic primary for Senate, until about two weeks ago, when you had each of the top candidates drop out and throw their support behind Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. You know, when you talk to Republicans, many of them say that they are ready to go back to the polls, go back to in November and vote for Ron Johnson. But I have to note that I have talked to a handful of Republicans who said that they were concerned that Ron Johnson, this will be his third term. He was someone who only promised to serve two terms. They said that they're concerned about some of the positions that he's taken. So if you look at polling, he is unpopular. It's going to be a blockbuster race once we get to November. All right, and Shaq Brewster is on it. Thanks, amigo. Appreciate your time. All right, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you nor I could possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. So this is what they tell us is going on in their regions. It's a segment we call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, look at this high-speed chase in Los Angeles last night. The suspect getting out of a possibly stolen tow truck, jumping onto a motorcycle, eventually escaping into an underground parking lot. It's not clear whether the motorcycle belonged to somebody else or if someone left it there for the person to get away. From our Northeast Bureau, a massive water main break in New Jersey is causing a major emergency in Newark. Of course, that's the city's, the state's biggest city, as well as nearby communities. Some residents reported having no water or low pressure. City officials are going door to door giving out water, and at least one hospital had to cancel or postpone surgeries. From our Midwest Bureau, it's Dolly Parton Day in Ohio today. Governor DeWine announcing it in honor of her visit to the state. So Celebrating her Imagination Library program that mails one age-appropriate book each month from when somebody is born to when they're five years old. Something like 45% of eligible kids in that state are part of the program, and that's pretty cool. Snapchat is rolling out tools for parents who want to keep a closer eye on what their kids are doing on the app. So starting today, parents and teens can opt into the family center. Parents can see their kids' friends list, the people they've talked to recently, and new friends that they've added. One thing they won't be able to see, though, is what their child is saying to their friends. Snapchat says 99 million people use their app every single day in North America. Meanwhile, another big social media platform is stepping up its privacy features, too. WhatsApp says soon its users will be able to control who can see when they're online, block people from taking screenshots of certain messages, and allow them to leave groups without letting the whole chat room know. Kate Snow joins us now with more on this. Uh, Kate, as a parent, this is intriguing. Talk yes. to us a little bit more about this announcement from Snapchat and then how it's really going to work. Yeah, well, you laid it out there, Tom. So it, it's called the Family Center. Uh, you, you noted that you have to opt in. So not only the parent, but the 13 to 18-year-old child has to opt into this Family Center. And then the parent's going to be able to see the list of the kids' friends, the people that they've communicated with over the last seven days, new friends that they may have added. Um, 
they've set the, the arbitrarily parents must be 25 and older to join because they figure that's probably the age of most parents, and they didn't want young people watching over young people. Uh, but it's really interesting, Tom, because, as you noted, it's, it's who you're friends with. It's not what you're doing on the app. And that's because of user privacy issues and mm -hmm. wanting to kind of weigh the rights of teenagers versus the rights of their parents to see everything they're doing. Yeah, and you've done an awful lot of reporting about some of the dangers that young kids have run into on Snapchat, yeah. right? Can you talk mm -hmm. us through that especially? You did a story, for example, on how kids are buying counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl on the platform, mm -hmm. and parents have been really demanding more safety controls like those. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of parents over the last couple of years who—, who are very frustrated, to put it mildly, with Snapchat. Now, Snapchat would tell you these parental tools that we're talking about are obviously for all safety issues. They're not just aimed at, you know, the drug dealing issue. They're aimed at anything to keep your child more safe. And, and they want to instill, they want to get parents talking to their kids and talking about, well, if I see this new handle, who is this, right? Because those conversations could potentially save a kid from linking up with a drug dealer. If their parents discovered that name and they had a conversation, maybe the kid would yeah. decide not to go buy something that they don't know what it is. So that's what they're hoping. I spoke with a family who did lose their son. Um, I spoke with Michelle and Zeke Mather. They lost their mm. son, Max, in 2021. I want you to take a little bit of a listen to our conversation around they like these tools, Tom, but they, they wish they'd come sooner. You wish they'd done it sooner. I do. Yeah, I do. Especially when, when Max was younger, um, we, you know, we would have probably been more involved. With Snapchat, there just wasn't a whole lot you could do. So, again, they're happy they're doing something. They wish it had happened before. They said they'll try to use it now with one of their younger sons, who's, who's still with them, to try to make sure that, that he mm. doesn't get into trouble. But it was, it's heartbreaking to talk to these families. And Snapchat, I should note, I mean, they, they've been very on this for the last year. They've been, they've been talking to me about increasing what they do to monitor for drug content. And if there ever is a case they find out about, if there's a dealer, they remove him from the platform, them from the platform. And then they also say, say that they cooperate now with law enforcement anytime they're reached out to. Yeah, and you talked also to Snapchat's director of uh, platform policy, mm -hmm. is that right, about concerns yeah. that this feature is weighing the privacy of teens over the rights of a parent to actually see what their kids are doing. So what did she tell you? Yeah, so that's that question I raised before. You know, you can't see what the kids are writing. And, and her explanation is, it's like real life. If your kids are in the basement and they're watching a movie with their friends, you know who's over. You know that the friends are, th are there and who's there. But you don't sit there as a parent and listen to every single thing they say to each other. So that's how they built this tool. Um, they think that's the right line to draw. I think some parents, you know, might want a little more information than that, but that's where they've drawn the line. Yeah, that's the never-ending debate, right? How much should <laughs> parents be involved, helicoptering parents, right. all of that. Yeah. Uh, Kate, thank you. Great reporting. Thank Thanks, you so Tom. much. Kate Snow. All right. All right, we now want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic that we've been keeping an eye on here. Tonight, parts of central and eastern Kentucky are under flood watches. Again, as the state recovers from the worst flooding in history, Kentucky's governor, Andy Bashir today said there is still a long way to go in rebuilding the area. Cynthia McFadden gives us a look now into how kids in eastern Kentucky are being affected by all of this devastation. She met up with actress Jennifer Gardner, who was there supporting the Save Our Children nonprofit. As we were waiting to meet up with Jennifer Garner at the devastated Robinson Elementary School, we saw three kids, Haley, Maverick, and Ariana, with very sad faces gazing down at what was left of their school. We play over here and, we're, and then we're all down that end. Two weeks ago, the school was flooded by a surge of more than eight feet of water overnight. How does it feel to look at it? It feels terrible. It's upsetting. It's right here. And Robinson was like our home. We met Superintendent of Schools Jonathan Jett, who lost not one, but two schools in his district. You need some help down here. We do. We absolutely do. And as if on cue, at that moment, Jennifer Garner arrived from California to advocate for thousands of kids like these. She knows that without help from others, this community will not have the resources to rebuild. Right before you, you arrived, we were waiting for you outside the school, and, and three little kids, 
second, third, fourth graders stop with their mom to mm -hmm. look at the school. And they were so heartbroken that they weren't going to be able to go to school. And they didn't even see what it looked like inside. It's shocking, wasn't it? Yeah, the impossibility of resuming life inside that building. That is not, I mean, the ceiling's gone. Three meals are served at these schools, and it is the case for many children that that last hot meal on Friday will be the last hot meal they have until they get back to school on Monday. Mm -hmm. So the, the pushback of the school year here is particularly devastating. It, it really is. You don't see people on top of the hills here, you know, suffering. It's the people in the hollers. It's people by the cricks. That's always been true. So much so that Save the Children first started its U.S. operations here in Kentucky 90 years ago, serving minors' children hot lunches. Eventually, they focus more on teaching kids to read than feeding them. But the pandemic and now the flooding have returned them to their original mission, making sure vulnerable children have enough to eat. What I hear is people need a stressor removed to help remove one stressful thing from this community. Get these kids in school. That's going to take some help. That's going to yes. take some money. The beauty is it's not political. I've been here under Republican governor. I've been here under Democratic governors. Taking care of kids is not political. Garner has three children ages 10 to 16. How do you explain to your own children this work you do? I just tell them the stories of the people I meet and what it looks like. And they're old enough now, it's time for them to start coming with me. But, you know, it's, I have a hard time stopping their lives to pull them out. But it is, it's time for them to come and get their, their hands dirty a little bit. All right, Cynthia joins us now. Uh, Cynthia, you so perfectly laid out how difficult life is for kids even before the flooding and this is such an important part of their lives right this is a school is their lives it's such an important contact place and point for kids well exactly tom and you know one of the things is the internet is is really hard to come by working uh, cell service is really hard to come by before the flooding so really remote learning wasn't a possibility for most of these kids during covid and it's certainly not a possibility now so the physical school is really important you know jennifer said something to me that i'd never heard before there is one book for every 13 poor kids, one book for every 13 kids who are living in poverty in rural America. That's just stunning. And she's devoted, as is Save the Children, to making that uh, no longer the case, bringing, bringing books to those kinds of kids. So the, the school, the physical school, the library, we went in the library, Tom, it was just devastating, uh, devastated, a library that Save the Children and helped develop. Um, how they rebuild, they need help. They desperately need help. You know, you made the point that Save the Children has been active for 90 years. Some, and there are some very high-profile people who have been a part of that effort over the years. And now disaster relief is a part of this equation, right? So that makes this even no, a, I mean, a you much can't, bigger you, challenge. It, it, yeah, terrible challenge. Very, very difficult. But I think that the, the feeling is that if everyone can give just a little bit, we can help these folks get back on their feet. Um, they are proud. Uh, every place that Save the Children uh, works, they usually put together groups, play groups, yeah. so that parents can go off and do what they need to do. In this case, they say the neighbors are helping neighbors. They're going to put their efforts somewhere else. All right. SaveTheChildren.org, if somebody wants to donate real quickly. Absolutely. Go. There's a, there's a special button you can press if you want to help in Kentucky. All right, SaveTheChildren.org. Cynthia, thank you. When we come back, Albuquerque police giving new details on their primary suspect who has now been detained after four Muslim men were murdered. All right, we're back with breaking news. Police in Albuquerque, New Mexico, now saying they have detained a 51-year-old man who they have charged with the murder of two Muslim men in their community. And he may be linked to the other recent murders there as well. They say they tracked down a vehicle believed to be involved in one of those killings, and they detained the driver. Four Muslim men have been murdered in Albuquerque since last November, with the most recent murder taking place just last Friday. Investigators say the attacks may be related and targeted against Muslim members of the community. Joining me now is Erin McLaughlin. She's been following this closely. Erin, what do we know so far about the suspect and the vehicle that they tracked down? 
Hey there, Tom. Well, police having that press conference now ongoing there in Albuquerque. They've also released a statement announcing the arrest of 51-year-old Mohammed Syed, considered to be the, quote, primary suspect in the recent murders of Muslim men in Albuquerque. According to the statement, Syed is being charged with two of the homicides, the July 26th murder of Aftab Hussein and the August 1st, 2021 murder of Mohammed Afzal Hussein. Uh, according to the statement, detectives connected those homicides using bullet casings found at the scenes. The gun used in those shootings was discovered during the overnight search of the suspect's home, as was the Volkswagen Jetta in question that had been, according to authorities, connected to at least one of uh, the murders. Uh, still outstanding questions remain. There are two other murders, the murder of 25-year-old Naeem Hussein, which happened on Friday, as well as the murder of Mohammed Ahmadi, uh, an Afghan who was killed in November of 2021. Uh, no word on those charges, although they say, authorities say they are working on other charges, adding uh, that detectives have discovered, according to the statement, evidence that shows the offender knew the victims to some extent and had an interpersonal conflict which may have led to the shootings. Tom? Uh, you just anticipated my question. That was going to be it. Did they have any sort of connection? Uh, before the arrest, you spoke to the brother-in-law of Naeem Hussein, who was found dead just on Friday night, right? So what did the brother-in-law tell you? You know, it was really heartbreaking. He was struggling to make sense of uh, this seemingly, in his view, an indiscriminate attack. Uh, Naeem Hussein had just become an American citizen last month. He moved to the United States from Pakistan in 2016, quickly trying to live the American dream, became a truck driver. He said that during the pandemic, uh, Naeem insisted on continuing to drive his truck despite the risks when other truck drivers were staying home, saying that Americans needed him, that Americans needed his deliveries, and was really looking forward to his wife living in Pakistan, joining him in the United States. His dream now shattered, as is the dream of four men uh, connected to uh, these, this, these, grisly, these grisly killings. Tom? All right. Again, the breaking news. A suspect has been arrested in Albuquerque in connection with the murder of two of the men and maybe two more. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you very much. That is a wrap for this hour. We're going to have more for you right here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage resumes on News Now right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.